This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Hoarfrost. We here at the Word of the Week have been thinking about the weather a lot lately. And that's for the same reason that a victim of a mugging finds himself thinking a lot about crime. In the past two weeks, we have been a weather victim multiple times. Like half of the United States right now, we find ourselves dealing with temperatures that no sane and loving God should ever bestow. Our pipes have frozen, our streets have frozen while we were driving on them, and we have found ourselves trudging too many times through drifts of ugly, dirty, solidified masses of frozen smog and snow, while having our faces bitten by stinging winds while we just try to carry out some basic freaking chores. Sorry. We're a little bitter about winter right now, in case you can't tell. But it is the start of a new year, and we're going to try to start things off right by staying positive. If we must talk about winter, and we must, let's talk about something nice, something pretty. Let's talk about hoarfrost. That might seem like a pretty random word for us to talk about, but we'd like to hearken back for a moment to the hoary days of yesteryear. Specifically to, well, to about 2008. That's when the fourth edition of our favorite game hit the market. Now, you can say what you will about Dungeons & Dragons 4th edition, and many have, but there is one thing above all that stood out to we linguophiles here at the Word of the Week. I mean, technically we weren't at the Word of the Week then, but we were still linguophiles, and we noticed something about that particular edition, something we mentioned a few years back in our Halloween episode about the word Eldritch. The designers of D&D 4E absolutely loved their thesauri. By the way, in case you didn't know, the word thesaurus is a sort of fake 16th century Latinization of the Greek word for treasure house, thesaurus. At that time, intellectuals referred to all reference works, dictionaries and encyclopedias especially, as the Sorai, because they were little treasure troves of knowledge. But it wasn't until 1805 when Peter Mark Roger compiled the first treasure trove of words arranged by meaning, as he called it, that the word thesaurus specifically referred to a collection of synonyms and antonyms for words. But we digress. Our point was that the designers of Dungeons & Dragons back in the 4th edition days had an obsession with very descriptive names for everything, especially magical spells, and also especially monsters. And we noticed at that time that certain words topped out their list of favorite synonyms. And among them was the word rhyme as a descriptor for anything related to ice, frost, or cold magic. In fact, the first time we ever heard the word rhyme, outside of an earth science class, was when Chris Perkins was excitedly discussing all of the new exciting monsters that were featured in the then upcoming Monster Manual and described the Rhymehammer Griffin. The reason we bring it up now is because Rhyme and Hoarfrost are a pair of very beautiful and related natural winter phenomena, neither of which would be remotely ludicrous fallout from the freezing breath attack of a white dragon or the remains of some wizard's careless cone of cold spell. And, in accordance with our desire to keep things positive, rhyme is actually one of the least harmful things winter can do to living things. Now, let's clear something up. Rhyme is R-I-M-E, and has nothing to do with words that have the same ending sound. And hoarfrost is H-O-A-R. By the way, so is the word hoary, which we said before, H-O-A-R-Y. Neither of them have anything to do with the... Let's just call them practitioners of the world's oldest profession. But hoary actually does have a lot to do with age. Well, sort of. As an adjective, it can mean gray or white with age. But what it really means is grayish white. And it's actually one of those useful and fun-to-use descriptive words for GMs. Tombs can be filled with hoary cobwebs. The elderly wizard can have a hoary beard. And animals that are covered in gray or white fur, like mice, can be described as hoary as well. When it is used to describe something that is aged, it usually carries a connotation of being aged and molded over. Trite. Old-fashioned. Tired, even. 
something of the distant past thankfully forgotten. Such is the hoary mechanic of rolling a bunch of six-sided dice to generate your character's ability scores. But Horfrost has nothing to do with age, and everything to do with appearing whitish-gray and wispy or furry. Presumably you know what Frost is. It's basically like dew, but frozen, right? And presumably you know what dew is. Dew forms when the ground cools below the dew point during the night. And that brings us back around to frost, which occurs when the dew point is below the freezing point of water. So that covers that, right? Sorry, did we give you high school or science flashbacks? We'll slow down a bit. Let's start with humidity. Humidity refers to the amount of gaseous water vapor that's currently floating around in the air around you. See, water is constantly evaporating, that is, turning from a liquid into a gas. And this is where things get a little complicated, because we generally associate phase changes, that is, solids changing to liquids and changing to gases or back again, with changes in temperature. And that's generally a good association. When a liquid, like water, gets cold enough, it freezes solid. And when we heat ice, it melts. And when we boil water, it evaporates. And that's because temperature is really just a measure of how agitated the molecules in a thing are. Every substance has a certain amount of cohesive force that holds it together. And these forces keep the molecules in a substance together. When the molecules are relatively calm, they tend to settle into close-knit patterns and pretty much stay together. That's why things are solid when they are cool. When the molecules start to get agitated enough, the stuff starts to spread out and lose its cohesion. Thus, as you heat things, they turn into liquids. Now, some substances really hold themselves together, so it takes a lot of energy to get the molecules to shake apart. That's why some things melt at very high temperatures. And other things barely have any forces holding them together at all. That's why some things don't turn into liquids or solids except at extremely low temperatures. You know, like the various gases in the air all around us. So given that, how is it possible for water vapor to exist as a gas in the air unless the air is hot enough to actually boil water? Never thought about that question, did you? But you can't discuss dew and frost without thinking about it. It turns out that any given molecule of a substance can, just by chance, leap right the heck out of the rest of that substance even if the substance itself isn't hot enough to boil. Molecules close to the surface of a glass of water at room temperature are constantly leaping out of the water into the air. Heck, molecules close to the surface of a piece of ice are even leaping out into the air. And that's not all. Individual molecules can gain enough heat energy from a surface to leap out into the air and turn into a gas. In fact, that is one of the most important ways your body keeps itself cool. Your body emits water, called sweat, whenever it needs to cool down. The sweat absorbs heat from your skin until it has enough energy to leap off into the air as water vapor. And that cools you down. In fact, water is constantly leaping into the air, which we call evapotranspiration, and falling back out of the air, which we call condensation. It's an endless cycle, and it's usually in pretty close balance. That's why everything isn't constantly damp, even though there's always vapor floating around in the air and falling out of the air. It's only when things get out of balance that we notice anything weird. See, the air can only hold a certain amount of water. Basically, you can think of the water molecules as fitting between the various molecules that make up the air. That's not quite accurate, but it works well enough. And the amount of water the air can hold, called the saturation point, is affected by the temperature of the air and the air pressure. Hot air and low pressure is spread out, right? It has a lot of room. Cold air and high pressure is squeezed tight together. Not a lot of room. And that brings us around to weather reports. When the weather reports that the humidity is a certain percentage, what it's really saying is that the air at its given temperature and pressure is holding a certain amount of all the water it can hold. And that, by the way, is why you feel very hot when it's very humid. Remember that your body cools itself by sending water into the air. If the air is so full of water that it can't hold anymore, your sweat can't evaporate, and you can't get rid of the heat. You just end up sweaty and gross. 
That's why people who live in the American Southwest can get away with insisting that a temperature of over 100 degrees is no big deal because it's a dry heat. Now, as the pressure and temperature change, the amount of water the air can hold also changes. So if the air is very close to saturation, and then the temperature suddenly drops, the water has to fall out of the air. And that's why rain happens. And that is why the weather also usually reports a dew point. The dew point is the temperature at which the air's capacity to hold its moisture will suddenly drop to equal the amount of moisture in the air. Usually that's the temperature at which rain will happen. And we're going to ignore things like supersaturation because this whole earth science thing has gone on long enough already. Let's bring this back to hoarfrost and rime and frost. Rain and snow are things that happen when a big chunk of the air suddenly finds its ability to hold humidity taxed. But sometimes temperature changes are less widespread, much less widespread. For example, at night the ground tends to cool, and that means that the air directly above the ground tends to cool. And if the ground cools to a temperature below the dew point, you'll get a layer of cool air that can't hold as much water as the rest of the air. And when you wake up in the morning, the ground and the grass and flowers and everything else will be coated with water. And that's where dew comes from. And if that happens in winter, and the dew point is below the temperature at which water freezes, that water will freeze as it condenses. And you'll get ice, which we call frost. Actually, we call it hoarfrost. See, the word frost generally refers to ice crystals that form the way we described. But when you get a fine layer of gray-white ice crystals covering leaves and grass and plants and anything else, that phenomena is, in aggregate, called hoarfrost. And that's to distinguish it from certain other types of frost, including something much more dangerous to plants, which may be familiar to anyone who's played the Persona video games. But we'll come back to that in a second because we have to explain something really cool here. We have to explain rhyme. Frost is quite pretty, but rhyme is outright beautiful and more than a little magical in appearance. Rhyme occurs when water condenses out of the air so fast that it doesn't have time to freeze, a process called supercooling, and then contacts a cold surface and freezes to it. This can happen, for example, when clouds are blown up the side of a mountain and the droplets of water in the cloud contact trees and rocks and other surfaces. And it also frequently occurs when airplanes fly through very cold clouds. What happens in this case is that you get these plumes of ice that appear to be made out of small nodules or beads. And they stretch out from the surface in one direction. So trees on mountainsides might have these icy spikes stretching out in the direction the wind is blowing and plain wings trail icy fingers behind them into the air. They also occur when natural geothermal vents blow steam or hot water into the air. So trees in the vicinity of geysers and the frozen northern equivalent of Skyrim might be covered with stretching tendrils of ice. That's rhyme. And it looks gorgeous. Look up pictures. Trust us. But now, let's talk about black frost, digital devils, and personal demons. See, there's another phenomenon related to hoarfrost and all this weather stuff that is the bane of farmers and gardeners and orchard keepers everywhere. Or at least everywhere that has potentially freezing temperatures. It's called black frost, but it isn't frost at all. In fact, it happens when frost should happen, but can't. See, frost happens when the temperature of the ground and the plants that grow there get cold enough at night to cool the air around them so it can no longer hold the moisture it has. But if the air is very dry and doesn't have much moisture in it, no frost is going to form. And what happens then, in the right conditions, is that the water inside the plants freezes. And when that happens, the plant tissue dies and turns black. Black frost is also often called killing frost. Now, if you're not a farmer, you might not have heard of black frost before. But if you're a gamer, you might have. Particularly if you're a Japanese gamer. Though more recently you might have heard of it even in America. The story begins with a trilogy of Japanese novels by Eia Nishitani 
called Digital Devil Story, or Megami Tensei in Japanese. The novels tell the story of two high school students who accidentally create a computer program that summons Lucifer. Whoops! In 1987, video game developer Atlas worked with Nishitani to create a video game version of the first book for the Nintendo Famicom and personal computers. The game was highly similar to the computer role-playing game series Wizardry and invited the player to explore a hellish labyrinth from a first-person perspective and engage in turn-based combat. But the game also included a unique interaction with some of the demonic NPCs that allowed the player to negotiate with and recruit the demons of hell. The game, and the books that spawned it, were quite popular in Japan, especially among role-playing gamers who enjoyed darker themes and more mature content than were on offer in other RPG series such as Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy. Following the success of Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei, a sequel was developed, and then other games soon followed. Much like the Final Fantasy series, the games were mostly unrelated to each other in terms of story, though they shared many themes and game mechanics in common and the Megami Tensei series spun off a number of other series, including the one that finally gained a foothold in the West, the Persona series, the sixth game of which was released in 2016 in Japan and 2017 in America to great critical and commercial success. Now, the path through the Megami Tensei series and various spin-offs to Persona is a convoluted one, and we must confess we don't have much experience with the games themselves here at the Word of the Week. But special mention must be given to the turning point in the two franchises. Shin Megami Tensei Persona 3, released in 2006 on the PlayStation 2. That game marked a rebirth for the Persona series and defined many of the elements that have been refined in the popular Persona 5. The most well-known aspect of the Persona games is the titular Persona system, which is one of a pair of ideas drawn from Jungian psychology of all places. See, in the Persona games, a group of high school students must battle powerful entities called shadows through the use of personas. To Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung, the persona was a mask that a person would wear in social situations, partly to facilitate social interaction and partly to hide one's true self. In the Persona games, the persona is a sort of super-powered mask form the characters create from their own personalities to confront their foes. And their foes are called the shadows. Now the shadow, to Jung, represented the dark, unconscious desires that lived inside the heart of every person. In Persona, the war between personas and shadows is front and center and rife with psychological and occult imagery, much of which is tied to Carl Jung. In Persona 4, the characters use tarot cards to unleash their personas, which ties into Jung's theories, which we discussed in our Dragon episode, about how images exist in the collective unconscious. But we digress. What does all this have to do with Black Frost? Well, throughout the Megami Tensei series, Black Frost is a recurring supernatural character. And in the Persona series, he's been described as an evil counterpart to Jack Frost. Jack Frost is, of course, a 16th century interpretation of a sort of fairy who paints frost on windows and plants. A mischievous figure similar to Russia's Father Frost in the English Old Man Winter. But those more modern personifications of the winter chill have a number of older origins. See, once upon a time, pretty much every meteorological and natural phenomenon was understood as the action of some supernatural creature, usually a deity of some sort. And gradually, those evolved into folk superstitions like Jack Frost and the collective unconscious of various peoples. Old Man Winter, Jack Frost, and Father Winter might have all been influenced, for example, by Boreas. Boreas was, according to the Greeks, the god of the North Wind, and he brought winter. He was depicted as a harsh, cranky, and bitter old man with a hoary beard. And we can't help but feel that's an appropriate depiction. After all, our attempt to find something beautiful to discuss about the winter brought us around to killing frosts, demons composed of dark secret desires, and hoary old men with hoary beards. Which just goes to show that whatever positivity we try to find in it, winter just makes us cranky. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. 
You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. Thank you.